Praise the Lord. We at Calvary Assembly of God believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe that God wants to speak through us to the congregation. And Sam did a wonderful job, you know, validating what was spoken this morning, but there's something that hit me. And do we realize what God is saying? He's running hard after us. He's running hard after us because he loves us with an everlasting love. And at towards the end of what Angela was speaking, the applause drowned out something that I heard that I don't know if you heard. He said, seek after me. And the impression I got is I wouldn't have to run so hard after you if you just turn and seek me. I mean, is that what God is wanting from each and every one of us is to stop running? <laughs> He's having, you know, praise the Lord. How many appreciate a God who wants to speak to us and wants to meet us right where we are today? Amen. I mean, look at what you've sung today. It's really kind of neat. He is a good God. Great is his faithfulness. And sometimes I wonder, and, and Ryan has said it, Pastor Kuhn has said it, it's kind of been put that way. Do we really believe what we sing? Because put up the, the bridge to the song that we just sang on Waymaker. And, and, and this is kind of the basis upon which I want to speak on today. It says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. By the time you leave today, I want you to know that beyond any shadow of a doubt. Because I think we struggle with that as a church. I think the enemy is playing with us as a church. I, I, I find it a privilege and an honor to continue the He is Worthy series that Ryan has started. But today I want to talk about He is Worthy of our trust. He is Worthy of our trust. I want to just start with a few foundational thoughts. Number one, we are naturally reactive to adversity, aren't we? How many here enjoy adversity this week? You have thoroughly enjoyed the hardship of whatever was going on. How many of you are anticipating great hardship this week? We are reactive to it. Do you know why? Because I ask this question a lot. How many of you are human? We are human, right? And so God understands that we're naturally opposed to hardship. And God seems to be the first target when adversity hits, isn't it? The enemy's got us fooled sometimes, and, and, and it's difficult to come to him because we somehow believe that he is allowing these things to happen to us. But it is during times of adversity that we need to trust him the most, isn't it? And trust in the Lord should be our attitude all the time. Whether things are good or bad, on the mountains or in the valleys, no matter how things look, no matter how we feel, God is trustworthy. And we have to learn to develop that. So there's two things I want us to understand. Number one, how many of us believe that God is trustworthy? How many of you believe that he is trustworthy for your Life today, especially when things are going wrong, especially when there's hardship in our lives, because God is the master of our hardship, isn't it? The year is 1985, and I was in the Air Force, and I was an aircraft mechanic back then on C-5s, 
And because uh, we were in the Air Force, you got a chance to take a hop to Germany to visit a friend, Brian Whitelock, who I had trained on the C-5, and he got stationed in Germany. So I wanted to go visit him, and so I took a hop over to Germany, to Frankfurt, and um, we kind of visited for a while. And we went to Paris. We wanted to have plans. I wanted to go to Paris. So he, we took his 1974 Mercedes, because nobody in Europe seems to drive American cars. <laughs> and, we were, and we drove the Audubon. How many of you know what the Audubon is? It is a highway that goes through Europe with no speed limits. <laughs> you want to talk about trust? <laughs> he let me drive. I was doing 94. I looked at my speedometer. I was doing 94. And people were passing me. I was in the slow lane beeping, you know, they were beeping at me. You're going too slow at 94. Wow. I had to trust the Lord then. But then we, we, we approached Paris, and, you know, there's a lot of city that's going on there. So um, what happened is we were getting into the city, and our brakes failed. The entire brake system was gone. We had to park the car right where it was. <laughs> it was kind of fascinating because what are we going to do now? And so we had a brilliant idea as Christians to lay hands on the car. So we laid hands on the car, and we said, Lord, we're just going to trust that you're going to heal the brakes. So we prayed for, the, we prayed for it. We were looking around, make sure nobody thought we were crazy. But anyway, we were, we were uh, praying for the car. And you know what the crazy thing was? We went sightseeing after that. We just trusted the Lord. It's like, okay, let's go. We go to the Eiffel Tower, the Arc de Triomphe, and all of this stuff, and, and I didn't even think twice. Usually I'd be kind of, man, we're 300 miles away from Frankfurt. What are we going to do to get back, you know? But there was something about the peace of God that was there. And so we came back to the car after all of that, and we got in the car and started it up, and the brakes worked. Amen. It's, it's a simple little illustration, but... There's a lot of things in our lives. And, and no, don't, don't, no, I don't want a mechanic coming up to me, Ed. <laughs> and telling me, well, the brakes just cooled off. It's just a natural thing that happens. <laughs> Somebody did tell me that one time. I'm trusting in the Lord's miracle, thank you. <laughs> Do we realize that God is completely trustworthy? And that he works in every part of our lives, especially when things aren't going quite as well. Jeff Francis lost his wife recently, and he wrote the following on Facebook. He said, I spent a lot of my Christian life thinking that faith is the connection between the problem and the miracle. Someone needs healing, a job, provision, relationship problem solved. Somebody needs a miracle. And you know how I thought that happened? You threw in some faith and you got what you needed. Especially if you had enough faith. Especially if you were really living right. That's what faith was to me. It was intended to be a cure-all. Something that when combined with Jesus could produce miracles. And he said this, I was wrong. You know what builds faith, he says? You know what causes faith to grow? It's when you don't get your miracle. It's when the healing doesn't come. It's when there's not enough to pay the bills. It's when your kids aren't going the right direction. It's when your wife dies. Because that's the stuff that faith is made of. Faith is seen in a terrible situation that isn't solved. Faith is seen when there is no solution. In the midst of your mess, you trust God anyway. You have faith anyway. That's faith. Faith is needed when you look around and can't find God anywhere. Faith is when you stop to think, can I feel God here? And the answer is no. I can't see him. I can't feel him. But I believe he's there. He never stops. He never stops working. Even when I don't see it, God is working. Even when I don't feel it, God is working. 
It's easy to believe in God for miracles when the miracles happen. But is it difficult? It is more difficult to believe in God for a miracle when it doesn't happen the way we want it to happen. I want us to go to Proverbs 3, 5. We, you know, have quoted this a lot. Everybody probably knows it. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not depend on your own understanding. That is kind of powerful to me. Trust in the Lord with at least part of your heart. Because, you know, when you're going through things, it's okay to have some doubt here. We just don't want to trust. What does it mean to trust in the Lord with all of our heart? With all of our heart. So what I did is I did a, a kind of a word study. And I looked up the word trust. And you know what it means? To trust. <laughs> but there's another word that, that's attached to it. To be confident in. One commentator says it expresses the feeling of safety and security that is felt when one can rely on someone or something else beyond any shadow of a doubt. But in the meaning of the word trust, which is interesting, it acquires the meaning the word confidere is in the middle of this word. And here's what it means. To lean with the whole body on something in order to rest on it, strengthened by if one leans wholly. To lean on so as to be supported by it. And, and there, here is, herein lies... The word picture. Because this is a wall over here. All right? And so the picture of trusting in the Lord is that this is a solid. Well, maybe it's not too solid here. <laughs> this is a solid wall. And it is like leading your whole body. The picture is like leading your whole body. Trusting, supported by, strengthened by the Lord. Isn't that neat? It's like that's what it literally means. That no matter what you're going through, no matter what is happening in your life, no matter what you may need in your life, you can rest totally as if you are leaning on God's presence in your life. Dorothy, could you come up a minute? Now let me demonstrate what it's like to lean on your own understanding. Now, she's, she's not quite a wall, but I'm going to lean on her now, okay? You're not, you're struggling here. There's a war. Okay. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I know. She, I'm, yeah, she's going to win every time, right? But that's what it's like, kind of like leaning on your own understanding. It's like that understanding wavers all of the time. It doesn't have the strength. It's not a fixed object that says, I can trust and I can gain support from something. And when you trust in the Lord with all of your heart, you are saying to the Lord, no matter what it is I'm going through, I'm going to rest my entire soul on your word. Because when I rely on my own understanding, guess what happens? It makes me waver. There is not the, the wall-like support there. I had, I had an illustration of that. I, tried, I was putting in my socks. How many of you ever put your socks on by standing up? <laughs> and and I, I did that one time this past week. I was, it was a really good illustration of what I, what, what I was learning here. It's like I kept trying to put my one sock on and try to balance you know? So then I leaned on the bed, and it was so much easier to put that sock on, isn't it? And that's my point. It's that the Lord is saying, no matter what it is that you're going through, lean on me. Trust in me. I don't care if it's relationships, if it is finances, if it is family, it is whatever it may be. It is a job, career. When you lean on the Lord, it's the safest thing that we can do. Every choice, every intention, every ambition, when it is given to the Lord, we will succeed. We may not succeed in the way we want it to be, right? 
Because take a look at what our earthly understanding is. It says, lean not on your own understanding. Because our understanding is fleshly. It's limited. It is shallow. It is self-centered. And I love what one commentary said. Arrogant self-reliance from which all fear of God is drained. We no longer have a fear of God when we rely on ourselves. But you rely on God. You are leaning completely on him for whatever your circumstance is. Amen? Some other translations in Proverbs 3, 5, the Amplified says, Lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, in the message Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. In the Living Bible, if you want favor with both God and man and reputation for good judgment and common sense, then trust the Lord completely. Don't ever trust yourself. But I love the Good News translation. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never rely on what you think you know. <laughs> Never rely on what you think you know. Because it's not stable. So the question is this. Why do we put our trust in God? Why should we put our trust in God? Let me just give you a few scriptures. In Philippians 4.19, it says, And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Matthew 6.33, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. It's interesting in, in these verses, in some of these verses, it requires something of us, doesn't it? It's like the Philippians verse. Paul is saying, God is going to meet all your needs. You know why? Because he was a giver. And God was able to meet needs because of the obedience of his people. And Jesus is saying, seek me first. He had just taught in Matthew 6, all of those things. Hey, you know, you, you worry about the cares of the world, but you know I feed the birds of the air. I clothe the lilies of the field. They don't worry because they trust completely. I love the Ephesians 3.20. Now, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think infinitely more than we could ever ask or think. Here's the problem with trusting on ourselves. And we get angry at God sometimes because he's not coming through. Because he's not coming through in a way you want him to come through because he says what you want is not what I want for your life. I want something higher, infinitely, abundantly, more than you could ever ask or imagine. And that requires seeking him. And not being resentful because something doesn't go our way. It is seen also in, uh, well, in Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Stretch out your faith. Trust in me. Because Isaiah 55 says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. <laughs> and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. And I love the phrase in the living, New Living Translation. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. If that's the case, how many of us want to rely on our own understanding? It's, in, it's interesting that those, that verse kind of goes, those two phrases kind of go hand in hand. You've got to trust in the Lord with all your heart, but you don't lean on your own understanding because it will cancel it out. If you're leaning on your understanding, you're not trusting in the Lord. And if you're trusting in the Lord, you're saying, Lord, I don't care what I understand about my situation. I'm going to keep leaning on you. Wow. So there are two things that we need to consider. Two things that we need to consider. Number one, we need a radical shift in perspective to offset our stubborn human understanding. All right? We need a radical shift in perspective to offset our stubborn 
human understanding. And I know understanding is not on the screen. Hopefully it's in your notes. And, and how many of you can attest to the fact that our, our human, when you've learned something great over the years, you've learned something, a lie, you've learned all these things, that your human understanding can be pretty stubborn, right? Because we take it from our own perspective. But we need a radical shift. It's like when something goes wrong, we need a radical shift. God was trying to tell the Israelites, you need to look at me. Don't look at your circumstances. You need to look at me. I am the one who loves you. I will guide you and direct you. Don't look at the circumstances. I'm going to get you where you need to be. And even Jesus was having some difficulty with the disciples because they kept going, huh? What do you mean by that? Because he was trying to elevate them. They're trying to figure it out on their own. But Jesus is trying to elevate the disciples, and he's trying to elevate us. He wants a radical shift. The next time something happens, I want you to pray to the Lord. Lord, give me understanding as to what I'm going through right now because I do not want to rely on my own understanding because it will only be sabotaged. Isn't it interesting that our reactions, and I find this profound, our reactions to life events expose what we understand and believe about our lives. <laughs> So in other words, if, if you have uh, something happen to you and your reaction is nothing but anger, resentment, and bitterness, it reveals something about your life script. It reveals something about what you believe. And, and God could be trying to get you to change that. Because the most important thing isn't that God wants to change the circumstances. He wants to change us in the circumstances. Don't focus on what you're going through. Don't focus on the lack. Don't focus on the conflict. Don't focus on those things that you're trying to understand. God says, I've got something higher for you. I want something better for you. He has a higher call. He, is, he loves us with an everlasting love. He is chasing after us. He's calling. He's compelling. And you, you just feel the Lord in this room today. And he's saying that. Look at your reactions to things. Don't get so insecure. Don't get so angry so quickly. Maybe we need some introspection and say, Lord, what, what, do, you, what do you want to work on today? We blame our spouse when it may be God. We blame our kids when God might be saying to us, I want to change something in your life. He can use the circumstances of our lives to perfect our mindsets. It's a radical shift in understanding. We need to transcend our circumstances. We need to trust the unseen and the unknown. And I love what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, because what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Reject the life filters that, we, that make us stubborn and look to the Lord who knows what it is that we need. We need to understand and realize the depth of God's love and passion for his people. I just cannot emphasize that more than, than I can here. He cares about us. And folks, do you know how I know that? Do you know how I know that? Do you know how I can be so passionate about God's love? Even though I'm human too, I'll have some thoughts in my head, okay? I don't want you to think I'm perfect. But when those thoughts come, I defer them to the Lord and say, Lord, I worry. I, I, I don't know. You know, I, sometimes I worry. Sometimes I look at the bank account and I go, uh-oh. <laughs> but then immediately after that, I just say, okay, Lord, it's in your hands. It's like I've had so much faith when we didn't have as much because I knew God was going to do something in it and through it. And we, we, we maintain ourselves in light of that. There's a really interesting story in Joshua 24. Joshua is kind of recalling and God is, is showing them something about what they inherited. And it says in Joshua 24, 11 to 14, When you crossed the Jordan River and came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. 
and all of those people. But I gave you victory over them. I gave you victory over them, and I sent terror ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites. But listen carefully. It was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. It was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. And I love this verse. I gave you land you had not worked on, and I gave you towns you did not build, the towns where you are now living. I gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. God is preparing the way for you, and you can't even imagine what he has for you tomorrow or next week or next month. But if we look up and we say, I'm going to trust the Lord, I know he's got something for me, and eventually I'm going to get there, and I'm going to see that it was worth trusting in the Lord with all my heart. Because he takes care of his people. He pursues us. He's running after us. He loves us with an everlasting love. And that's what he's trying to say today. And so he says, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. So a radical shift in perspective is needed. Finally, the second thing is go on the offensive, not on the defensive. Folks, I I, I do not believe that God wants us to go on the defensive in this war of spirituality and darkness in our world. Let me tell you what I mean by that. How many are into sports? You know, and and sometimes I watch football and it kind of drives you crazy sometimes when your football team is ahead and then they relax. You know, it's like they let off on the gas. And you hear the commentary says, well, it appears that they're not really looking to win, but they're looking to not lose. <laughs> Have you ever seen, seen that? It's like it's somehow you, you get the lead, and then now you kind of rest on it, and now I'm going to just kind of coast in. And, and some get caught by that. But I thought, what a great spiritual application is that we are victors in Christ. We have victory in our sights. We've read the book, and we win at the end. Don't stop winning. And what we do is we go into a defensive posture and says, well, I just just don't want to lose my salvation here. You know, I just want to make it. I'm just trying desperately to make it. Folks, when you have a defensive posture, you're hesitant and fearful. You're angry when things happen. You blame other things. You become negative. You rely on your own understanding. There's a fatalistic thinking. Our life script takes over, and all of a sudden, God isn't as important because I'm focusing on the enemy that is coming against me. But you are victors. I don't care what the enemy is coming to get you with. You are victors. It is time to go on the offensive. It is time to take control of what we are going through and tell the enemy that my God is a loving God and he will meet all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So what does it look like to go on the offensive? Folks, this is exciting. Because God is with us. He wants us to renew our minds, to take mental control, transcendent thoughts, to trust in him with all of our hearts. We need warfare prayer. We need to be able to pray through. We need to be able to say, Lord, I'm going through this, and I am going to to tackle this with every ounce of prayer that I have because I know that you love me. It is solid stand on the word. And when I'm going through confusion, I study the word more and more. And I get to the point where I know that I know that I know that he is giving me everything that I ever need. But there's one other thing, and it was talked about last week. It's worship. And so if I can bridge this to what Pastor Ryan and Angela were talking about, what better way to kick the enemy in the gut than to worship God? Amen? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. Did you hear Angela talk about that? Have you ever been driving down the road and you're singing worship songs? 
and somebody cuts you off? <laughs> and all of a sudden, the worship stops. <laughs> you see, the challenge is this, is that no matter what happens in life, and that's living defensively. That's a defensive posture. The offensive posture is like, I'm going to sing anyway. Playmaker. But there is something about that worship. There's something about that song. When you can get back into it, it is going on the offensive. It is allowing the enemy to say, gone. I'm going to trust in the Lord with all our heart. That's going on the offensive. I would challenge every one of us, sing unto God. Worship him when you're going through something bad. Watch. what it, it, it's, it, You're going to tangle with your flesh. I'm not going to want to do this. But if you know what it's like to push through and go, this is in your hands, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your hands. Rick Pino on Instagram said this, one of the best ways to show God that you trust him is to worship through difficult times. Wow. It's like it's not all, even when I don't feel like it, he's working. Even when I don't see it, he's working. He said this is the only time in all, in, in all of eternity that we get to worship God through pain. <laughs> I don't know what you feel about that, but that's hard. To worship God through pain. To worship God through your circumstances. But somebody that I want to close with here. His name is Job. How many know he's been through a lot? He went through a lot. And he would say to us, I loathe my very life. Therefore, I'll give free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. You know, he would say, if I change my expression and smile, I still dread all my sufferings. It would have been better off if I hadn't been born. He was human like one of us. But something he said that was extremely powerful to me. He says, even though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Wow. I do it because though he slay me, yet will I wait for and trust him. And behold, he will slay me. I have no hope nevertheless. I will maintain and argue my ways before him and even to his face. He was saying, and this is what, this is what it literally means, to wait, to tarry. When you don't know what to do, you are discouraged and you think God is beating you down. The one thing you can do is wait and tarry. And when you wait and tarry, you can trust in him. And you can say, even though you might be doing it, which wasn't true, even though it is happening in my life, because it was his perception of it. Guess what? We still trust him. I'm desperate to see. Because I deal with a lot of hurt and pain. And the first thing that gets lost is God. Because we're discouraged. We're anxious. We're in conflict. What happened to the God of this universe? And I don't blame anybody for going through those things. I went through it. We all go through it. But the only way that we can get to the same attitude as Job is to fill our lives with integrity. Can you just think about that for a minute? Why did Job hold on? Because he knew God. And he worshipped him. Why did Jesus never say a word when he went to the cross? Why, when he was accused of things he did not do, that he kept his mouth shut? Because he trusted in his Father. That's so hard to do. But we're called to do the same thing. Aren't we? We're called to do the same thing. Job transcended his circumstances to see God. He still hated where he was. But he vowed to trust and wait on him. I want to close with Jeff Francis again. This is a continuation of his post. I don't know what you see when you look around, and I don't know what you feel when you, when you stop to think about it. 
But what I do believe is that God is working in your situation. I don't know it because if I knew it, then it wouldn't be faith. But I believe it. I trust that is true. And you can too. Your faith grows when your life is falling apart. You trust, your trust deepens when you can't see the miracle worker. Your hope flickers when it looks like his promises aren't true. This is because we don't walk by what we see. We don't operate by how we feel. We have faith when we cannot see. We trust when we cannot feel. And so if a crisis is what causes our faith to grow, then we can be thankful even for them. We don't look for problems. We don't create crisis. But we know they will come. And when they do, we hope for a miracle. We pray for a miracle. But even when it doesn't happen, we have faith. Even when you don't see it, He's working. Even when you don't feel it, He's working. He never stops. He never stops working. He never stops. He never stops working. Amen? When we look at worship, never stop worship. My thing today is continue that worship. Don't ever stop trusting. Develop that trust. Don't let the circumstances define that for you. Amen? Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Lord, we're just coming before you today in awe of you. We thank you for your word spoken after the second song of worship. We want to understand that. We want to heed it. It is kind of an awesome thought that the God of this universe is running after us. That you want us to trust in you with all of our hearts and to lean not on what we understand. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for being the God of this universe who transcends what you already know to come down to us in Jesus. And die for us. But Lord, you gave us an example to live. And so Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know you, the first step is just inviting you into our hearts and into our lives. A simple prayer that says, Lord, I'm a sinner. Come in and forgive my sins and be the Lord and Savior of my life. It's about the attitude of the heart. And I know the Bible says many are the tribulations of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. We're going to face things this week, and I challenge every one of us, Lord, that when we do face something, these words come to their minds. Trust in the Lord with all our hearts, and don't lean on my own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge you, and you will direct our paths. You are a good God, and you are running after us, and you want to love us with that everlasting love. Let us open ourselves up. Let us stop running, turn, and see your love. Open up our hearts through our circumstances, Strengthen us, we pray. Thank you for this word and for being with us in fellowship. We honor you today and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go forth and transcend your circumstances this week.